book of Isaiah is, is one that's very important to the, the Christian community because we find so many messages that, that point to the Messiah, to the Christ, to the chosen one of God that is coming into the world. And here in the book of Isaiah, toward the end of, this, uh, of the writings of his prophetic word, we find a message that seems to be directed to a particular kind of people. So if you will, join me in Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? Almighty God, as you speak through the prophet into the nation's heart, you bring them the possibility of joy. You bring them something to light their coming days, to let them know that all of the darkness that they have known is now passing away and that you are doing something to change their reality. We rejoice over what you have done and accomplished through Christ our Lord. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for the change that he has wrought within our lives, within this world. Now help us be a part of bringing the good news of bringing release to the captives and binding for the broken hearts, that the word of the Lord may go forth in praise and in joy. In this message, may my words be yours, that I would speak wisdom and truth according to your will and your word. And may our hearts and minds find the joy that you offer in Christ our Lord, in the life that Emmanuel, God with us, has brought. I pray these things in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As I said, Isaiah's words seem to be spoken to a particular group of people, and, 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 and the group of people that it seems to be directed toward are those people who are living at the end of the exile in what was Babylon, what is now Persia. It seems that these words are, are spoken for them that there is coming a day when they are going to come back into their land and they are going to reestablish their homes there. The words of this prophecy are for a people who are either about to or who have returned from exile. 
They are words written and spoken to a people who are coming back to a Jerusalem that his walls are broken down, that the temple has been destroyed, that all of the grandeur of David's building and Solomon's continued building, all of that is gone. As they walk through the land of Judah to return to Jerusalem on Mount Zion, they see that the fields are filled with the brambles and with the weeds and the wild animals because nobody has tended the ground. These words are being proclaimed to a people who many of whom are penniless. They've given up the life in their exile home. They were there for 70 years as a people. Many of those who were taken away are now very, very old. Most of the ones who are returning were not born in this land. And so they've given up their life in Persia to return to the rubble of Jerusalem and the weed-infested lands of Judah. Some of them are coming back as servants. Some are coming back as slaves. Some are coming back as prisoners of another who is in authority. Many of them are coming back as a people who feel that God had punished them and took them out of that land, and many of them feel God is still punishing them as they walk into what was their home. With the exception of only a few, there was no hope. There was no vision for a better future. And Isaiah speaks to them, the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. The prophet's words were hope for something better. The chosen one of God would come to transform what their reality was, to bring freedom and prosperity and joy, to enact vengeance upon the unfavored and com comfort upon the favored to set things in a pattern forevermore that would favor those whom God has chosen. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, this message seems to be picked up on a little bit. In John chapter 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And in verse 19, we hear his testimonies. The Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? John confessed, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? John responded, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now these people had been sent from the Pharisees, and so they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of his sandals, I am not worthy to untie. John is saying the one that the prophet said was to come, the chosen one who would come and change everything, the chosen one who was going to transform, the one that the Spirit of the Lord was upon and anointed to do something different, that one is here right now. You just don't know who it is. You're not aware of it. I'm not him. I'm not the one, John says, but he's here. And he is far greater than than I am. John is continuing the message of Isaiah telling the people there is a chosen one from God who is coming and we know that the chosen one is here because I've been anointed to tell you that he has arrived and John is speaking into a similar circumstance as Isaiah he's talking to a people who are oppressed 
He's talking to a people who are poor in spirit. He's talking to a people who, who they have not known anything but captivity from the Roman Empire. Many of them, they go out and they work and they work and they work and yet they cannot prosper because the Romans will come in and they will take from them through taxes. And so they can't get ahead. The city of Jerusalem is occupied by the Roman army. The Roman governor has a house there. The, the daily life is observed and monitored by those who are not of God's chosen people. And so there are many who feel that God is still abandoning His people. Many of them turn to the only thing that gives them meaning, and that is either the strict practice of the Pharisees or the, the slightly looser practice of the Sadducees. They have nothing to see as a change coming from the future. Yet John says the chosen one is coming. Then over in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. Verse 16. Rejoice always. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul is telling the church that the chosen one has come. And the chosen one has brought something that it sounds like Isaiah was prophesying. It sounds like something that John was offering to people. It sounds like this, this transformation of, under the Spirit's anointing that Isaiah claimed is now reality. The people can rejoice always. The people can pray without ever stopping for anything. The people can give thanks in every circumstance that is what isaiah seems to be saying don't worry god is going to send the anointed one and transform your life and you're going to see reasons to rejoice you're going to have a reason to be able to pray and give thanks in every circumstance john the baptist says look the one is right here he's he's coming and and paul says we know that he's coming all of these things have been affected in fact jesus himself in luke chapter 4 says to the crowds when he read Isaiah 61 today it's been fulfilled in me I am the one he says who will bring this change Advent reminds us that the chosen one who was promised to come into the world to change and transform everything has come the world has not felt the same since we've heard of Emmanuel, God with us. There is something that happened that, that altered reality around the life of Christ, the Jesus that we are introduced to in Bethlehem. We know that the world is different and turned around because Jesus the Christ's life and death and resurrection and ascension made it different he has changed everything this god with us but there are those among us who cannot feel that change this time of year is very difficult for some people this time of year is not easy for everyone Many of us, we look at this time of year and, and it's filled with, with happiness and a lightness of spirit and a joy and, and remembering the fond traditions and getting ready to be, celebrate things. But there are some who look at this and they have no lightness of life. They look at this time of year and there is nothing to, for them to look forward to. For some, grief and the pain of loss rises to the surface they come to this time of year and they can be moving along normally and all of a sudden they're stopped in their tracks because they realize that somebody they dearly love 
is not with them this year, at this time of year. And their daily momentum is stopped in its tracks. For some, depression strikes hard in this time of year. Maybe it has to do with the sunlight. Perhaps it has to do with all of the stress. Maybe it has to do with, with how things change in this time and people cannot cope with that. But we know that people begin to look at their life and they don't have the energy to go forward. They don't have the energy to face those things that have to be done and they retreat into themselves. We know that despair overwhelms some people because they cannot provide the Christmas that they think everyone is expecting. Maybe it's because that Christmas bonus wasn't as big as they anticipated. Maybe it was there wasn't enough money to begin with. Perhaps it's just that they can't build up that energy to do what they need to do. And so we look at these people and we see their lives and their rejoicing is not possible. Their prayers have stopped cold they see no reason to be thankful jesus the christ emmanuel came to bring transformation to these very people explicitly to these people they are the imprisoned they are the brokenhearted they are the poor in spirit he has come specifically for those people and yet they cannot feel that change and that's been my story this year for the last year the trauma that I have gone through everything that I've experienced all of the lows and so few highs has brought me to this year and I find nothing to rejoice over this year I find nothing that, that lightens my spirit at Christmas or the thought of it this year I don't feel the change that Christmas has brought. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but every year, one in four normal people have a mental health crisis. One in four normal people have a mental health crisis. 25% of the population probably doesn't have anything to be joyful about this year. Luckily for me, I found a few things that make a difference. I found a few things that, while I'm not really super joyful about this time of year, they have enabled me to kind of engage with this year. I found some things that, I found some things that bring me joy little things, not big things, but they let me get through the day. I found that prayer is, is a big part of my daily living. And I've also found a community that I'm a part of that reminds me that the world is good. And I found dogs. You see, there's nothing that any of us there's nothing that any one of us can do to change the reality of anyone who's suffering. We can't change what's going on with them. We can't change their hearts. We can't change their minds. Their pain, their depression, their despair is real. But more importantly, it's their reality. It's their world that they live in. But I want to offer those things that I found as a way for us to touch those lives. The joy that I found, it doesn't have to be grand. In fact, joyful people get on my nerves really quick. I should say happy people get on my nerves very quick. Joyful people I'm okay with. But I found little things of joy that get me through. One of the things that I had to do to kind of get myself back in better shape was I had to quit following certain things on social media because it would just tear my spirit apart to read them. But I found something on social media that, that brings me a little bit of joy every day. It's called the dodo. The dodo is... It's the sharing of stories 
of animals who were forgotten, animals who were overlooked, animals who were abused, discarded, rejected. They may be ugly as sin. They may be disabled. They may be just unwanted. But the dodo goes and they highlight these animals and they show those animals being accepted and welcomed and brought into a new family. And for me, it is so joyful, those little stories of those critters. Now it has a downside. Now I want every unwanted puppy and baby goat that I see on there. But for me, it's a little bit of joy. And every time I see a new one of those videos, I stop to watch it. And yes, there are times when it wants, I want to cry because it is so heartbreaking to watch it, but at the same time, there is that feeling of joy on the inside of that. Those people who cannot experience joy for themselves, maybe we can bring some little joy to them. Maybe we can do some little thing to point out that, you know what, this, this thing can be your little piece of joy and life. I found out that prayer can be ugly. So many times we think prayer has to be pretty. So many times we want prayer to be perfect. We want prayer to be filled with, with praise and, and rejoicing and happiness. Or, or we want to pray for other people's needs and all of the things that's going on in their life. But I found out, you know what? Prayer is sometimes ugly. It has to be. It has to be ugly because there are these things that are going on inside of us, these things that, that we can't express to anyone else because we're afraid that if we tell anybody else, they'll think there's something wrong with us, but there's a God who hears those prayers. And in fact, if you go to the Psalms and read the Psalms, they're not pretty sometimes. And they are not about other people's concerns. And they are not picture-perfect words. They are the pain and the suffering and the anguish of that person saying, God, do something for me. Fix me before you do anything else. But there are some people who they just cannot pray. They cannot even give themselves the luxury of the freedom to say those words to God. So maybe we need to pray for them. Maybe we need to pray with them. Maybe we need to pray in their place and say those things that they don't feel that they can say themselves. I know there have been a lot of people praying for me, and I do appreciate that, but there are days when I want somebody to pray for me and say the things that I can't say. I want to talk about how bad my life is, but it just tears me up breaks me apart and I can't pray I want somebody who will say those things for me maybe we can do that for people and maybe we can be a community for them I found a community a few years back I encountered a, an author who writes fantasy and Granted, science fiction and fantasy are my favorite books to read. And as I got into learning more about him, I discovered he does a fundraiser every year. It's called World Builders. And World Builders is, is built around the idea of geeks like me who want to do some good. And so a few years back, I got involved with these people, and, and, and every time right around the, the first part of December, the end of November, first part of December, there's a big fundraiser, and, and we found a community with each other online. And we connected online because of our shared love for this thing. But more importantly than that, we, we want to do good. We want to do something to change the world in some small way. This year, about 5,000 of us in our little community got together, and we raised a million, over a million dollars. A million dollars that's going to go out and change lives. Now, it doesn't radically alter the world. It doesn't, it doesn't transform where my circumstance is right here and what I'm feeling. But for me, getting together with those people and laughing at the same jokes 
or, or telling stories about what's happening in our life or, or maybe even just venting and saying, you know what, today my life is really hard and having people say, you know what, so sorry. They're there. And I know that they're there for me and with me. We can be that community for people that we know that they don't have that joy, that ability to rejoice always. They don't have that ability to be able to, to bring themselves into prayer. They don't have the ability to give thanks in every circumstance. They look at their life in, in grief or they look at their life through their depression or they just sink into that despair and they need a community around them who doesn't want to fix them but just wants to remind them that there's good in the world and that they're a part of that. Because Emmanuel came to change the world, to bring good into their life, to bring good into what they experience. Jesus said, For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and release to those in prison, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. There's not much we can do to change someone's situation, to change their circumstance, but we can remind them of the Emmanuel who came to change everything, especially their life.